All right, Andy, take it away. All right, so welcome everybody. Um, and for those of you that don't know me, I'm Andrew. I have been a AAA member for I think maybe about two years now, and I've been doing astrophotography since about 2019. Um, only started getting more heavily into the uh, deep space aspect of it over the past um, two or three years. Um, I started with my home scope, which was um, a Red Cat 51, and now I upgraded to a Red Cat 71, and I have um, ASI 2600, and I control everything through the ASI Air. But um, you know, since the GRT has been around, um, I've been an operator and. I've had the privilege of using the scopes out in Texas under very nice skies that are difficult to get to from New York City. Um, so definitely um, opens up a lot of possibilities and, you know, gives access to a lot of good data. Um, and one of the images that I've uh, acquired for the GRT and process in the past um, is M101, uh, the Pinwheel Galaxy, which is what we're going to be going through tonight. Um, so really quick, I'm just gonna have to restart Zoom because, um, hold on. You have the recording going and it's not letting me share my screen because I haven't, um, enabled the recording to record my shared screen. So I'm gonna have to enable that and then just, um, reopen Zoom really quick. Okay. Okay. So I'll yeah, be back in 30 seconds. Yeah. Okay. Right back. So George, does it seem like people like we're gonna people are gonna go to North South Lake this weekend or? Oh, yeah. Oh, that's what you mean. That's what you mean. Uh, not, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Not tonight for the Aurora. No, I can't make it out tonight. It's I have work in the morning, sadly. Yeah. Uh. Well. So let uh, I uh, I can be the coordinator at least for one day. Mm -hmm. Um. As, as you get closer, <laughs> let's see which one is better. Uh, I see the extended forecast that Saturday yeah. night seems to be okay. Um, and well, I you know I never really trust uh, this uh, you know until at least three days, if not two yeah. before. And then if the forecasts converge, uh, you know I look at a couple of sources, uh, and actually in uh, 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 what is it, Sky. Ventus Sky in uh, in Ventus Sky they'll they, they allow you for clouds as you get closer they they allow you to pick from the various models two or three or four models so oh, okay if they if they seem to be you uh, in, in agreement then that's a good sign and but uh, yeah um, you know the philosophy um, is uh, if you don't go then you don't get anything yes um, true yeah yeah. Well, I mean, if the weather improves right now, the forecast does not look terribly good. Yeah. But if the forecast improves, I'm certainly planning to go, and I'm one of the coordinators. So. Okay, great. That that will help. Hopefully. Yeah. Now we just need good weather and no smoke. Uh. Yes. Oh yeah, the smoke. The smoke. The smoke oh my has god, been it's terrible. Great. Yeah. Gave me bad headaches and everything. Oh, bad. Yeah. So can everyone see uh, my screen with the pics in sight? I can yes. see. Okay. Um, Stan, it just sent, and I was mistaken, each file is 500 megabytes because I um, applied a two times drizzle, um, which increases the file sizes. So the, those just sent to you, Stan, keep an eye out for them. Um, okay, so I guess let's get started. Um, so just off the bat, um, you know, I kind of gave a little disclaimer on Discord um, that I am by no means an expert in all this stuff. I've kind of gathered um, all the information I use to help process these images through multiple YouTube videos, trial and error. You know, these things are dynamic. They're constantly changing through updates, um, you know, people figuring out different techniques. So, you know, my my flow and my process changes all the time. And it also depends on the image and the quality of the data. And, you know, you run into a lot of technical difficulties because as I'm sure you guys know, this stuff is quirky. So, um, 
you know, it's meant to be kind of casual. I'm just going to show what I do. But at any point, if you guys have a question or a suggestion or know uh, something I'm doing possibly wrong, please interrupt me and just let me know. Um, so I have here um, four images. I have R uh, RGB and L of M101, which is the pinwheel galaxy. So these images were obtained through the AP-175 scope um, with the FLI camera. Uh, it's a monochrome sensor, so we had to use uh, four different filters um, to get this data. And then I processed it um, through this script um, called weighted batch preprocessing. And what this does is it enables you to upload all the lights, darks, flats, dark flats, um, you calibrate them, you stack them, and then there are other options too where you can um, you can um, enable drizzle, which is upsampling, um, and then you run it. It does everything in kind of one streamlined process, and then it spits out your images, and that's where we're going to be starting now. So I already did this. Um, this takes a little bit bit of time, so I'm not going to do it live now. Um, but, you know, there are a lot of uh, YouTube tutorials on weighted batch preprocessing, so I definitely recommend um, looking at those if you're not familiar with it. Um, so anyway, here we are with the four files. Um, generally, one of the first things I do um, is I'll relabel them. So just start with G, go to identifier, uh, make that G. Um, and it just gets rid of the generic um, labeling that weighted batch preprocessing uh, puts. Um, and as you can see here, these are um, drizzled uh, times two and auto cropped. And I know a lot of people aren't fans of auto cropping because sometimes the program can um, crop out things that you might actually want in the image. But I already reviewed the uncropped versions and it's essentially the same. So these are the auto cropped ones. And make that B. And L. Okay, so the first process I run on these images is dynamic background extraction. So, um, you know, depending on your setup, the quality of the sky, other factors with your equipment, you can get gradients um, and the gradients can be um, from light pollution from the moon sources um, and then you know essentially you apply flat to your image to um, correct for any vignetting um, which is a flaw of the equipment um, but you know despite that you could still get gradients and you could still get um, things that the flats don't correct for um, so, you know, this is the L, which has the most, um, I think, detail in it. So I usually use this as a guide for, um, you know, the gradients I'm looking at, any issues with the flats. Um, so right away, I could see that this part of the image looks kind of lighter than up here. So I'm going to have um, some things to deal with. Um, so the process I like using for um, gradient correcting is... Um, dynamic background extraction, um, which is under processes and then dynamic background extraction. There are like, I don't know, three to five different things you can use. Um, there's a new thing called, um, I think, gradient correction that a lot of people like, but I'm not as familiar with. But um, dynamic background extraction essentially lets you tell um, this process what the background is. And you do that by clicking around and clicking just in the background. And then you run it and it removes uh, the gradient and just leaves you with the flat image. Um, so one thing I've learned to do is you just raise the tolerance and shadows relaxation. Exactly why I can't explain, but I think it just allows for you to select more areas um, that are represented in the background without the process telling you you're picking the wrong thing. Um, and then depending on how many stars are in the image um, depends on the size of the box you pick because um, you don't want to get stars or parts of nebula, parts of the galaxy um, 
in the boxes because then you're essentially telling it that's what the background is. So I think for this image, probably around 30 should be good. Um, we'll put a box and kind of see what that looks like. Yeah, so that looks good. And if everyone looks here, as I go over a star or right area, you get that big black blotch. So that's what you want to avoid. Um, so, and then before I forget to, um, before I forget to do this, so under this section, target image correction, you have to tell it what to do. So you have essentially two options, subtraction, um, which is for gradients, um, and division, which is more for like a, it acts almost like a flat. Um, it's more so for vignetting. Um, sometimes one of them is good, and then sometimes you have to run both. So I always start with subtraction, um, and then you know we'll run that and see what it looks like. So I'm just going to move kind of fast because um, this could be tedious and just start throwing boxes and everywhere that I think is background. And the reason why I'm zoomed in here is because I want to you know look out for stars and gal background galaxies and stuff. Hey Andrew, someone going to say something? Yeah, yeah. Uh, on that. So like uh, you mentioned the tolerance. Uh, this is something I like learned very recently. So mm -hmm. on the tolerance and the shadows relaxation. If you're mm -hmm. like dealing with an image where the whole frame is filled with nebula and mm -hmm. you still need to gradient correct, mm -hmm. then if you up those values, you're including more of you're including more of the sample in the background mm -hmm. model, which will subtract a lot of what you're trying to capture gotcha yeah so so yeah. for like for images like that i i usually try try my best to keep as tight a, like a tolerance as possible mm -hmm. yeah that, that makes sense honestly i haven't worked with too many images where it's all nebula and no background at all yeah um which i guess is both unfortunate and <laughs> has made me kind of complacent with uh doing this the same way every time um, but yeah, that's, that's good to know. I think it, like all these processes there, you can find individual YouTube videos that go into extreme depth on every little variable you can change. Um, and it can definitely get overwhelming, but again, the more, you know, the more kind of tools you have in the toolbox to, uh, yeah. do different things. To yeah. Use. I noticed that after, you know, some of my, some of, some of the images I worked on a few months ago. I like, mm -hmm. there was like, just like these really, really heavy contrast between the sort of dark areas and the lighter areas of the nebula. And yeah. it's because uh, it was just subtracting the, uh... all the, uh, cause I, cause, cause I was also like re raising the tolerance and I was subtracting too much of the nebula. Gotcha. Yeah. And then, you know, that that also brings up the point that a lot of this is kind of just trial and error yes. and, you know, you run something, you see how it looks. And, uh, if you don't like the results, you just control Z and try again. Um, and there's a way, you know, there are ways to be more efficient than control Z -ing. like you can make clones very easily. Um, okay. So I, I kind of went to each quadrant laid, laid, um, these little boxes down, kind of covered all the areas, major areas. And then I always zoom out and just make sure I'm not covering anything uh, that looks like galaxy or nebula, which I think this looks pretty good. So before I run the process, um, so I have subtraction selected here. I'm actually going to take this little triangle and drag it off. And that saves um, everything you see here. So then when I go to the other images, I can just um, open them, open this, uh, double click this icon, and it'll apply these boxes to those images as well. Um, so I'm going to run it and we'll see how it looks. Okay, so now we compare. Yeah, so that looks definitely flatter. Um, you can see the biggest difference up here. So I like the way that looks. Um, I'm actually, I didn't mean to create a new image. So I'm just going to, oops. 
I think it's still open there on the right. Yeah. It's, it's, to... There oh, it is. Thanks. <laughs> thanks. So I'm just going to discard the background model and replace target image and run it on. Oops. Oh, what did I do? You got to hit the check mark now because you're. Oh, yeah. There you go. Yeah. Thanks. All the very intuitive aspects of the yes. <laughs> user interface. Exactly. All right. So that's the um, gradient removed image. So I'm going to actually close that dynamic background extraction because you have to when you go to the next image. So that's your L. And now I'm just going to run this quickly on R, G, and B. So you can see R you know, has a very big gradient. So I'm going to open that up. Um, place target image, start background model. Oops. Run that. Can you say again the meanings behind the RGB and L? Um, they're the different filters. Um, so this is the R image. Um, so in terms of data, I can't remember how many R images and so on and so forth there were, but say this is like, you know, we took um, 53 minute images on the R filter. So this is the calibrated and stacked um, R image. Um, so with monochrome, you have to use um, filter filters for each um, color, and then you combine them to produce a color image. Um, so this is the R. Uh, does that make sense? Yes, thank you. Okay. Oh, hold on. And L for luminance. L yes, L for luminance. Be, uh, basically, uh, you cut out uh, UV and infrared, correct? Correct. So you're getting all of the colors. Um, so it gives you the most detail um, in the image, the most information. Um, and then I'll show you how we use that um, in a moment. OK. So now all the images, L, R, G, and B, are uh, gradient corrected. Um, and then essentially what I'll do from this point is an R, G, B combination. So I'm going to treat the R, G, and I'm going to combine the R, G, and B, um, and use that as one image, and then the L um, I'm going to work on separately. So to do that, I'm going to open channel combination. I'm going to reset that. And then I'm just going to drag and drop um, each image to the respective channels. Um, and then I'm gonna run it. So then what this gives you is a color image. And then, so something important with this, if you guys are familiar with the screen transfer function, um, before you color correct the image, um, you have to unlink it and then stretch it. And that gives you an, um, something that's more realistic to uh, what you can expect. Uh, so everyone can so see Andrew, the color in that. Andrew, you didn't, you didn't include the light, right? You just did the RGB, that's it? Correct. I did not include the luminance. Uh, okay. um, so the when you process the RGB and luminance separately, Essentially, the luminance is telling you how bright and dark to make the different areas um, and how much detail um, there should be. And the, and the color, the RGB color image is just telling you what colors to apply. So you have the chrominance and the luminance are two um, separate parts of the, of the image. And you're essentially exhibiting more control over each aspect of it by splitting it this, this way. Um, as opposed to one shot color where everything's kind of combined and, um, you know, you have to run everything as one entity. Um, this just gives you a lot more control. Um, and also the monochrome sensors give you, it's a lot more sensitive and it gives you a lot, a lot of detail, um, respective to how much time you're putting into it. Okay. So I'm going to work on this RGB image, um, really quick. So I'm just going to relabel it RGB. Um, so one, the first thing I like to do, so 
Um, I like to process everything um, starless and then process the stars separately. It gives you a lot more control over the nebula, the galaxy, and then um, you know you can control how bright you want the stars to be separate from the subject of the image. So um, the first thing I run actually is I um, run Blur Exterminator, which basically um, is an AI process that will correct um, any issues with the stars. So let's just see. I mean, this is pretty good data, but the, and the stars are very pinpoint. But um, sometimes, if you look at the corners, there's some star trailing. The stars could be a little bit bloated, just imperfection. So it'll correct for that. Um, and then. In addition, you can have this uh, perform essentially deconvolution, which is sharpening. So it'll sharpen the nebula, the galaxy, uh, whatever the non-stellar uh, component of your picture is. But right now I'm just going to do a correction, which means it's going to correct any imperfections with the stars. And the reason why I'm going to do that is because when I do color correction, I use um, SPCC, which is Spectra Photometric Color Calibration. and I've seen that you have to do that before you do any um, blur exterminator um, deconvolution of the non-stellar objects, so the galaxy and the nebula. Oh, is that right? I didn't know that. Yeah, as, as per uh, one guide, um, okay. <laughs> I didn't try it. I didn't try it with... Um, without doing it this way, but I think it's specific to the most recent update to Blur Exterminator, which is uh, version four. Okay. So you're uh, supposed to you're yep. supposed to color correct, you said before color correct. Um yep. So you can you can do the star correction um and then color correction and then apply blur exterminator for um the non stellar object. Did, and everything I'm, should work um work better that way. Now I'm now I'm curious why, but I don't know if you it. I think uh, I mean from what I understand, it just has to do with the blur exterminator a blur okay. exterminator AI, and um, not only how blur exterminator runs, but how it changes the um, the I guess details of the picture so SPCC can run more accurately um, if you don't um, do the full blur exterminator in the beginning. Beyond that, um, I can't explain it. <laughs> okay, so I did Blur Exterminator um, for the star correction. Now I'm going to do color correction. So part of uh, weighted battery processing, when you um, put in your lights, you put in um, the details of the object you're imaging. So it can plate solve. And then it kind of embeds the plate solve information into the picture, which is essential for SPCC, which uses... Um, the plate solve information and applies it to a catalog, which has, I guess, known color information for everything that's in your image. So there are some details in this that you need to put in. So you have to put the sensor you're working with, which for um, us is this um, KF16200, um, and then your filter information. So um, I've been using the Astrodon I Series R. Um, so you do RGB, um, and then what you have to do is it does background neutralization as well. So you have to select an area and tell it what the background is. So I'm going to create a little preview of an area I think is the background. It doesn't have to be big. Um, and then select that region of interest is my preview. And then I'm going to run SPCC. And this takes a moment. So now we're doing our color correction. And then after this, um, I just like to cancel the um, auto stretch and then relink and then restretch. And then that is our color corrected image. Um, at this point, um, so if this was a one shot color um, image, um, you would do blur exterminator for the um, non stellar object, which in this case is the galaxy, and that'll apply deconvolution. Um, but for 
um, a non one shot color, I only do that to the luminance because that's where I'm going to apply the detail to the image. Um, and that'll make more sense a little bit later on. Um, so right now I'm going to do just a little bit of noise extermination, um, noise reduction with noise exterminator. Um, I usually do very uh, light here, like 0.25. Um, and then that's also going to tighten up the stars a little bit as well. And then at this point, um, I've done all the processing I want to the stars and then I'm ready to pull them. So I'm going to use a star exterminator. I'm going to generate star image because I want to use the stars again later on and apply. This is one of my favorite uh, steps because it's the first time you kind of see the image um, with the stars removed and it, you could just see how much dust there is, how much background detail. So essentially everything here that's not M101 is a background galaxy. And you know, you could see all these little, I don't know how well you guys can see it on your screens, but you know, there's a lot of background stuff going on. Um, so what I do notice is a little bit of a green cast here. Um, so actually what I'm going to do is add the stars back and then I'm going to do SCNR, um, which removes a little bit. Um, so kind of what I like to do is make a preview. Um, I usually don't, I'm not aggressive with this. Um, and a lot of these processes, um, you know, less is more. So I usually do a little bit, see how it looks. And then if I need to add more, I'll do that. So I'll do SCNR, um, kind of 30%. Um, see how that looks. That looks good. So I'm going to apply that. Okay, delete my preview. And then remove the stars again. I'm actually going to delete this. And the reason why I added the stars back and then in um, removing them again is because I, the SCNR I want to apply to the stars and the galaxy. Because if I did it just on the galaxy, then the stars might have um, a green cast that's a little bit different from the rest of the image. So, Andrew, what's SCNR? Um, it's essentially a noise reduction that can be applied to different, I guess, color noise parts of the image. Um, if I'm explaining that right, but you can remove certain colors. So if your image has a green cast, which is most common because um, green, well, I guess color sensors have a lot of green because there's usually more green um, in the, the Bayer matrix. Um, so you can apply red, green, or blue and remove whatever color cast you have. And it helps just like neutralize things a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, okay, I, I guess as the... you remove I, I guess the uh, CNR is color noise reduction. I, I kind of yep. trying to figure out what the S may stand for. Um, off the top of my head, I'm not sure. Yeah. Um, right. I always call it SCNR, but you know, again, there's a lot of resources for reading in more detail, but you know, just keep in mind as you remove the green, if you remove too much green, it might make the image a little bit purple um, and you know, so on and so forth with the, uh, the other, other colors. Um, okay, so let me just name that stars. Um, I'm just going to name this um, starless. Um, okay, so now the RGB, I'm going to stop working on for now, and then I'm going to open up the L, the luminance. So the luminance, this is where the detail um, and the brightness of the image is going to uh, really come from. So um, for this, um, it's a little bit quicker. So I'm just gonna run Blur Exterminator, but I'm gonna run it on both the stars and the galaxy. Um, so this gives you the option of how much to sharpen the stars and how much to sharpen the either nebula or galaxy. So um, the stars, I'm actually not gonna use from the luminance image. I'm only gonna use the RGB, so I'm gonna lower that to zero. And then um, I usually do like 0.35 or so for the non-stellar, just to not be too aggressive. Um, I'm gonna run that. Okay. 
Does everyone um, here use PixInsight or does anyone use something different for processing? I use PixInsight. PixInsight. So it's been a while and okay. I forgot a lot of it. Yeah, and it's always changing, which makes it hard. Okay, so now we blur exterminated the image. I'm um, gonna do some noise extermination, a little bit more aggressive um, than the color image. Um, and that's because I'm gonna do another technique a little bit later on that further noise reduces the color. We usually go to like 0.6 for this, anywhere from 0.6 to 0.7, but this is um this image has a good amount of data, so um, I think 0.6 should be fine. Okay, and then I'm going to remove the stars, but I'm not going to generate a star image because I'm not going to use illuminant stars. Yeah, you know, I never have any, like, I never have good luck running noise exterminator before stretching. I want, I'm just... Why is that? I always find that it just does weird, it does weird things where it makes the image, like, uh lose a lot of detail, look a little like uh, creamy and mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know how, how to describe it, <laughs> but. Yeah, um, I think you're probably using too much. Um, are, are you typically using closer to like the default to 0.9 or are you going less than that? No, I, I mean, I've tried, I, I tried it going really quite low in the linear and then I, mm -hmm. I just, stopped applying it in the linear phase. I think it works pretty well, um, like after stretching. Um, mm -hmm. but, uh, yeah, yeah, I, um, sometimes I'll get issues with that. Um, for the most part, if I just reduce it, it's okay. But I, I generally stretch, I try and reduce some noise. So I'm not stretching the noise as well. Um, but you know, I think, you know, either way works fairly well, depending on the data. Um, starless, uh, so now we're up to stretching. Um, so stretching is basically, um, you know, transitioning from linear to nonlinear. Um, and I think is one of the um, highest learning curve uh, portions of this. Um, you know, there's a lot of different ways to do it. The way I've been doing it uh, more recently is uh, GHS, which is generalized hyperbolic stretch. And I could spend an hour going over this um, for the sake of time. I won't do that. But, you know, if anyone is interested in learning more about it, I highly recommend it. And there's a lot of YouTube tutorials. Okay. So what I'm going to do first is open up a preview. And one thing I like to do, I click this plus to zoom in. Um, I like to lower the black point a little bit. Um, and that helps with just the stretching and helps separate kind of the background from the main part of the image a little bit more. So I'll change this uh, generalized hyperbolic portion to linear and just move that black point over and then apply it and reset. Okay, that's it. Um, and then this next portion, I'm just gonna raise the local intensity up to about 10. And then I'm going to start stretching until I get a nice background. Okay, so that looks good. I'm going to apply that. Reset. Um, so now I'm going to select an area that is a little bit um, on the outside of the galaxy, kind of wispy. Click that. And then a little bit more there. So I'm, what I'm doing is set, setting a symmetry, a symmetry point, which is going to set an S curve and kind of focus on just this area of the curve. Um, so I'm going to send to symmetry point, put my local intensity up to about seven, and then start stretching. And what you'll see is it's going to stretch this area that I clicked on and suppress the background a little bit, actually. It's not going to suppress the background there, sorry. But I just want to raise this to the point where I'm happy with um, this kind of lighter, wispier area. Um, sometimes you could have messed the local intensity a little bit and a little bit the symmetry point. And then I'm going to send that. And then I'm going to sequentially go into a little bit brighter of an area. 
send that to symmetry point where use my local intensity. And what the local intensity does from what I understand is it protects the highlights. Um, and then I'm going to stretch that area. Now see how this portion is getting brighter and the background is getting a little bit suppressed. Um, a little bit more of that. Send that. Um, and then let's do the highlights. Send to symmetry point, raise the local intensity. And then as I get to the highlights, I'm going to bring protect highlights down a little bit, which is going to bring that white point down just so I don't um, blow out the brights. Bring that up a little bit. Send that. And then it kind of brought my background down a little bit too much. So I'm just going to go back um, kind of to a, a darker area and bring that up a little bit. Um, so this is the stretched um, RGB. One thing I could do really quick to increase the saturation is just change this to, sorry, change this mode to saturation and just bring that up a little bit. And you can see how that's making it nice and saturated. Okay, now I'm going to stretch the luminance and then just keep in mind this curve. I generally try and match the brightness of the RGB and the luminance. So I'm gonna keep this curve in mind and try and get the luminance kind of around here. And I'm just gonna go through this a little bit quicker because it's essentially the same, same process. Bring that black point down. Bring local intensity up. You don't want to be too aggressive. So now you can see the curve is kind of getting into that same point that the RGB is at, but I could actually go a little bit more because as I move to the highlights, it's going to bring that background down a bit. Go to a brighter area. And a lot of these things, um, you know, adjusting these sliders, I've, I've done this a bunch of times, so I'm kind of familiar with where each thing should be, but at any point it doesn't look right, you can go back and try again, or you can just mess with the, each of these sliders until you get, until it looks good. But what I like about this GHS is it it's almost like curves in uh, Lightroom or photo, Photoshop. It gives you pretty tight control over each aspect of the curve. Um, let's do that, and I'm gonna do one more for the very bright portion. Get those highlights a little bit, bring that local intensity up. Oops. So I didn't send that to the symmetry point. Just a mistake. So, all right. So now I'm just going to click this and can kind of compare the curves. So that's the RGB curve. And that's the luminance curve. So I'm just going to raise the luminance a little bit more. Okay, so luminance, RGB. Okay. So I'm going to minimize the luminance for now. And now they're both stretched. Um, so one thing I like to do with um, the RGB is kind of um, just tweak the background a little bit. So what I want to do is if you look at the background, um, there's some color to it. Um, I don't know how well you guys can see it on your screen, but there's definitely color noise. Um, there's kind of a green tinge to it. So what you could do is you could selectively desaturate that. And the way that you select um, the way that I like selecting um, nebula galaxies, um, and then you can invert it, 
and picks and sizes either through ACDNR um, or range selection. So I think for this, I'm gonna use range selection. So it just picks, um, I guess like a luminance range. Um, so I opened up a preview um, and then I'm going to just tweak this until I get um, the galaxy and also the background galaxies. And then what I wanna do is smooth it out. I'm gonna smooth that um, and then run that. Okay, so that created a lot of artifact. Um, and I think that's because of the noise um, in the image. So I'm going to actually delete that and try it again. I probably just need to be a little bit more aggressive. Um, Okay, so that's not really working. And it's weird. Guys, I don't know why it's not some of the uh, yeah. I think it's because of the because of the noise. I can't I can't really remember from the last time I did it, but I I could lower the background brightness, but then that might make the RGB combination a little bit weird. But actually, let's let's just try that. So what I'll do is I'll open up curves transformation now. Um, just open up the image and you can see the curve. I'm just going to select an area that's the background, set a dot there, um, and then just control each aspect of the image of the uh, curve. And do this and then this. And what I'm going to do is just lower that background brightness a little bit. And then run that. I'm going to see if this helps. And if not, we'll try something else. Okay, so that's much better. So now what this is, is a mask, essentially. Um, so I'm gonna apply that match. So right now, um, everything in red is protected. Everything not in red is active. So I'm going to invert this. So I wanna only affect the background um, and protect um, the galaxies. Just going to not show the mask. And then what I'm going to do is open up the curves, reset that, open up a preview, and then I'm gonna go to saturation, click the background so I could see where it is, and then set points around it, and then just lower the background saturation. And that's gonna desaturate the background. Um, opposite that, you can invert the mask and resaturate um, the uh, galaxy. Um, so maybe I will do just a little bit of that. So I'm going to invert the mask, reset, open a preview. Just increase that saturation a little bit. And then I can even go to the red channel, go here, and then increase kind of that center of the galaxy, make it a little more orange. So I won't go, I won't do this too much now, but you know, you could spend as much or as little time as you want tweaking the colors, but I'm generally careful tweaking colors um, as opposed to just working on the saturation because the SPCC color corrected everything as it should be. Um, so once you start going into, um, you know, calibrating the colors far, further, it can make it unrealistic. Okay, so that's all I'm going to do um, with that mask. And then, oops, okay, remove, I removed the mask, but it's here if I want it again. Um, and then one thing, so this is just going to determine the chrominance of the of the image. Um, therefore, detail here is not important. So something else you can do to lower the noise is actually convolute with the opposite of deconvolution, so blur the image. So I open up the convolution tool for that and then increase the bottom bar, the standard deviation. 
just to the point where it blurs a bit, but doesn't obscure um, all the details. So I usually bring that up to about 10. Run that. Was that preview? Okay, so then that is done. So now we're up to LRGB combination. Um, Wait, can you, so, can you just, sorry, sorry. Do, do you mind just describing yeah. that last step? The, so what, why are we blurring the so, image? So essentially, you know, there was still, can you, I don't know how much detail you could see here, but if In, I control the- <laughs> Very little. Yeah. yeah. Okay. There's, there's a lot of chrominance noise and non-chrominance noise in this image. Okay. So instead of um, applying other noise reduction techniques, you could just blur the whole image and it'll kind of, it'll just blend all, it'll blur that noise out. Because when you're doing LRGB combination, none of the details are coming from the right. RGB. It's only coming from the luminance. So a, a, a kind of quick, um, it actually works really well, in my opinion, way to deal with that noise in the RGB which it's going to have more noise than the luminance because generally it has less um, combined data um, if you if you prioritize luminance for near imaging is to just convolute it so you know again you don't want to be huh. too aggressive but if you just blur the rgb image it essentially gets rid of a lot of that noise and again you only want the color color information right so then you could just apply Illuminance, which is all the detail, and then um, you don't get chrominance information in that noise that might carry over to the luminance image, if that makes sense. I, I understand, yeah. I never thought to do it's this. Just, this it's is a, interesting. Yeah, yeah I, I saw it in a tutorial from, um, I think his YouTube name is Entering Into Space. Okay. Steve Miller. I don't know. It might be a different guy. Um, and he did that and I started doing it and it works really well. I'll have to try it. It's just noise reduction. Yep. Okay. So now um, we're ready to combine the luminance image with the RGB image. Um, so for that, I'm going to use LRGB combination. Um, we only want to combine the luminance channel. So I'm going to uncheck RGB, drag over the luminance, minimize that. And you know you have these parameters down here for lightness and saturation. Um, depending on your stretch of the RGB and the L, when you when you combine with the defaults, might be too much, might be too little, it might be too much or too little saturation. So this I think it requires a lot of tweaking. Um, so what I do is I usually you can either do a clone, so you don't have to keep control Z. So I'll just do that. Use the clone for now. And then I'll apply this in the image and see how it looks. And then depending on how it looks, I'll make my tweaks. And then once I figure out the settings I want, I'll apply this chrominance noise reduction and do the official combination. Okay, so that looks a little bit bright. Um, it looks like it might be starting to get a little bit blown out in the center. Um, so I'm going to, let me see this one. Um, I'm actually going to go back and just do a little bit less um, convolution now that I'm looking at it. So I'm just going to undo convolution, go back to this, you know, like nine. Uh, so it's a lot of back and forth. Um, and you guys have kind of seen the um, the candid version of processing right now because it's been months since I went through this image. So I don't really remember all the finer details. Um, okay, so I, re I changed the convolution. I just created a clone. Um, and then I'm going to reduce the lightness a little bit. And um, I always forget, but these these bars, like one of them, when you go up, it actually reduces it. When you go down, it increases it. So I'm pretty sure the lightness, when you go up on it, it decreases the lightness, but we'll find out right now. I know it's very counterintuitive and correct me if I'm wrong, but essentially go up and down until you think it looks good.
Okay. Um, I think I'll do a little bit less because it's getting I'm losing some details in these arms. I don't know how well you guys can see it. I think I'll do one less, uh, a little bit less. Go up to like 0.7, and I'm going to increase the saturation a little bit. And now I'm going to apply noise, uh, chrominance noise reduction. Let's see how that looks. And if it looks less than perfect now, um, I probably won't keep going back and forth and doing it just for the sake of time. But essentially, I would just keep undoing and redoing until I got the result that I wanted. And there might be a more um, streamlined way of doing this that I'm not aware of. Um, but I think the most important things are matching the curve of the RGB and the luminance um, to make this combination a little bit more straightforward. Okay, so I like that. Um, you can then go a little bit further with um, curves transformation, um, either with either with or without a mask. I think just for the sake of time right now, I won't use a mask. And then um, we'll just open up a preview, look at that background, set some, just do a quick uh, curves adjustment. add um, a little bit more contrast there. Generally, I would, um, at this point, um, take it into Photoshop and do some more curves um, adjusting and color saturation, just because I'm more comfortable. There's certain things that Pix Insight's great for, but um, things like masking and curves adjustment and saturation control is is definitely better in, in Photoshop, in my opinion. Um, so a lot of times I'll go back and forth. Um, but, you know, this is essentially what I would do in Photoshop at this point. Um, so on that, and then I'm pretty happy with this image. Um, um, I'll add the stars back in. Now, I'll... People do a lot of different things with stars. Um, generally, I would say most people do some form of star reduction. Um, and there's a lot of different star reduction techniques. Um, the one that I like to do just involves the amount of stretching that's done. So I'll generally stretch um, not aggressively um, to the point where I'm getting a lot of background stars. I'll just get you know, some background stars, and then obviously the bigger stars will come through. Um, so I'll do that quickly. I'll just open up my stars image. And then um, one thing that, um, just to note with this, is that Pix or Star Exterminator um, mistake in some of the galaxy nebulae or stars. So as I'm stretching, I'm gonna have to pay attention to this because if I understretch um, these nebulae, then they're not gonna be in the galaxy. Um, and I don't want that. Um, that being said, those are pretty faint. And, and if I stretch those, it's gonna bring out a lot of background stars, which is gonna make that whole star reduction technique I, I spoke about um, less apparent. But there are ways to selectively stretch the nebula um, that are in the galaxy, as opposed to the background stars that just has to do with masking um, that I won't get into right now, but you know, depending on how artistic you want to get and what you want to bring out and suppress, there's, you know, a hundred things you can do. Um, just in general, this is uh, linear. So I'm going to um, undo the auto stretch, open up uh, GHS, um, open up a real time preview, sorry. And then I'm just going to stretch up until I see those um, galaxy nebula, nebulae pretty well. All right. So maybe go up to there. And then also what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring the local intensity down because that's going to tighten up those bigger stars a little bit and then pr protect my highlight to bring that white point down so I can blow out any of those stars. Okay, let's apply that and see how it looks. It's always a little hard to tell from the preview. 
Um, so sometimes I go back and forth. I go out of the preview, kind of zoom in and see how it looks. Yeah, so that looks okay. Um, so now I'm going to screen the stars back in. So um, with Star Exterminator, if you go to, if you hover over this generate star image, um, oh, sorry, this unscreened stars. Um, so there's two ways to combine stars back in, just a straight up combination and a screening. And I think the screening um, is generally producing better results. So when you use Star Exterminator, it unscreens the, star, the stars as opposed to just uh, uh, subtracts them. Um, and I, I don't know in terms of a more intricate level what the pros and cons, why this produces a better result, but from my experience, it does. Anyway, the formula um, that you're going to put into pixel math to rescreen the stars back in is under this unscreened stars. Um, if you hover over it, you can see it. I think you guys can see that. So I have a process icon saved. So I'm going to double click that. Now I'm going to open up my starless image. Oops. Sorry, my starless clone. So this is very specific to the image identifier. So I actually have to just close this one out because I'm not using that anymore. Uh, change this from starless clone to starless. And then my stars that are stretched are already named stars. Um, we could actually, before we add them back in, apply a little saturation to that. I like saturating the stars a little bit. Uh, okay. Not too aggressive. Okay, and then open this up, minimize the stars, and open up our pixel math. Um, so this is the formula for screening the stars back in, and I'm going to replace this in image and then drag and drop and there we are so this is the fully pix insight processed image of m101 um, from here um, you could save as um, generally from here i'll do um, a tiff open it up in Lightroom Photoshop. Um, if you want to make any additional tweaks, crops, I like doing that stuff in there. Um, and that is basically it. And I am a pixel peeper, so it's my habit to always zoom in and kind of um, look at what we're dealing with. Um, so this, this image still has some noise. Um, and you could apply more noise reduction. Again, I like doing a little bit less up front and more at the end if needed. Um, but I think this looks pretty good. Nice job. It does. Yeah, look it looks good. great. That's it. Thank you. Very nice. Um, so any questions? Um, you know, yeah, I, I have, know that was I have, kind of... I have a couple. I missed it in the beginning. Uh, what did you image this on? What did you use? Your own telescope or the gateway? Um, this was uh, the gateway. Um, so this is the AP one seventy five with the monochrome um, camera. Okay. Um, I believe I did this back in March or April. Um, so okay. the data has been available for, for a while. Um, just and go back what, to what Zoom. did your integration look like? I mean, what was your exposure, exposure time? Um, honestly, I'm going to have to go to <laughs> Astrovin to pull up those details because I don't remember oh, off the top okay. of my head. Um, so let's see. Um, this was so. One thing I didn't I didn't talk about um, that I'm sure everyone does in some way is looking through all the images before you um, stack them. So PixInsight has a process um, called Blink, um, which enables you to upload all the light frames and kind of uh, scroll through them fast and look for um, basically in perfections in the image that you don't want to carry over to the final image. So, you know, sometimes, especially if you're tracking, uh, I'm sorry, if you're guiding, um, you know, something might streak across the image that makes the guiding go crazy. And then that one image is ruined because the stars are all messed up. So you could delete certain images that don't look good. 
um, then you're only stacking the good images. So once I went through that, um, the and all the good images. So the blue channel had twenty um, lights at three hundred seconds, so about an hour and forty minutes. The green channel um, and the red about the same. So all those twenty times three hundred seconds, uh, twenty times five minutes. And then the luminance channel was thirty-eight times to five minutes, which is about three hours. Um, I actually did H alpha as well, which I didn't show you guys now, uh, just to bring out the nebula within the galaxy a little bit more. Um, I got two hours, um, 12 times 10 minutes on that for a total of 10 hours. So without the H alpha, let's see, one, three, four and a half, it's probably about seven and a half, eight hours of just LRGD. Um, so a pretty good amount from Boral to Skies. And, you know, because of that, you could stretch, you know, a lot of M101 that doesn't have um, as much information from as high quality skies. You can't pull out a lot of this outer arm kind of wispy detail. Um, so I was definitely happy about that. I was happy about a lot of the background galaxies that you can see. Um, and I was happy about a lot of the intricate detail we could see in the arms um, of the galaxy. Um, I didn't, I didn't process this in a way where it really brings out the dust lanes, um, enough, but when I spent hours doing this on the image I posted, let me see if I can share my screen, um, just share my desktop. Oh, I don't know if you guys can see this, um, the full resolution. We're still seeing pics inside. Oh, you're seeing pics, oh, sorry. Um, is that better? So yes. in the final image um, that I ended up posting. Now we see it. Um, yeah, um, I was able to bring out a lot more detail with like these little dust lanes. Um, you could see the nebula have a lot more color. Um, you know, I was able to get dust lanes kind of all the way down to this core, which was very impressive and just as kind of an attestation to the dynamic range of the sensor and the quality of the skies. Um, so I was very happy with that. Um, yeah. How much time did it take so to this, do this from a post processing sorry? from a post processing standpoint? How many hours did you invest in that? Um, with with just this image, yeah. Between Pix Insight and I guess mm -hmm. Photoshop. Um, I would have to say probably like five hours or so just you know I like taking my time doing everything slowly kind of going back and forth until I get everything kind of perfect the way I'm imagining um so I'm I'm generally pretty slow with all this and then going into Photoshop and I like to do everything kind of iteratively iteratively um so you know very slow make little tweaks see how it looks and then do a little bit more so you know it's it's very individual um but I would say for this image, probably, I mean, figure it just took us an hour and 12 minutes to go through the processing through Pix Insight, which I would say compared to when I did this image has been getting faster and faster. Um, that took an hour, but when I did it, it probably took anywhere from like two to three hours and then all the other tweaking afterwards. Um, it's definitely a good amount of time. So um, but for me personally, how fast? Yeah. I was, um, well, I did this at the time on an iMac with, um, I think an Intel, what is that, like an i9 processor? Let me pull up the actual details. So, I mean, just is that like a regular or is it like a souped up or? I mean, it's, um, I don't know what you consider souped up, but I, you know, I, I, I use Macs. Um, so the, the one I did this on was, um, it was an iMac from, I think, like 2001, 2002. It's got 32 gigs of um, memory of RAM. Um, and it's using an AMD Radeon Pro um, 
a graphics card and a 3.6 gigahertz 10 core processor. I think the Intel i9. Um, All right, so it's a 10 then, core. It's pretty pretty fast. It should be pretty. Yeah, fast. it's it's pretty fast. It's definitely pretty fast. Um, which it's especially for the AI applications, yeah, like Blur Exterminator, you know. Oh, it definitely makes a big difference, but I, I understand with like PCs, if you have an NVIDIA um, graphics card, you can run, uh, use CUDA, which is like, um, it speeds everything up. I'm, I can't even begin to explain how it works, but I think people get pretty good results with that. Um, but yeah, you, you, you need a lot of memory because, uh, sorry, a lot of hard drive space, space because, you know, when I stacked... I'm sure Stan can attest. I just sent him four files that were 500 megabytes each. Um, you know, when I say this as a TIFF uh, from PixInsight, it's usually, I don't know, anywhere from two to two to 400 megabytes. So you're working with big files. Um, so hard drive space memory, I think, is, is important. Um, right now, I'm doing everything on an iMac. Um, with an M3 processor, which is even more amazing. <laughs> um, and everything runs pretty smooth. Yeah, it's um, M3 Max with 36 gigs of RAM. Um, I think a two terabyte hard drive. Um, so yeah. That's impressive. So, Andrew, thanks. what bit depth are you working in? Um, I believe in Pix Insight it's 32. Um, and then when I save it as a TIFF, it's 16. Yeah, the 32, that'll, um, yeah, that'll the, make your files pretty huge. Yeah. At 32 bits. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I whenever I save the XISF, I always, you know, I think it even goes up to 64, which I've never done. And I'm not sure how that would look. Um, but I think definitely at least 32 bit when you're working with the XISF files because you want, you know, as much information as possible. Um, when you save, um, I don't know if you can run anything beyond 16 bit in Photoshop, but you know, when I save, I save this as a TIFF, um, you know, 16 bit, um, and then it's compatible with Photoshop. So definitely at least, uh, definitely 16 when I go to Photoshop, because again, I want as much information as possible. Yep. All right, I'm going to unshare. Am I still sharing my screen? You are. You are. I know I oh, stop share. Sorry, I'm not as familiar with uh, Zoom. Um, so yeah, that's everything. Um now any more questions um in general? Or you know, I could also share if anyone has specific um questions with certain processes and picks inside, I could share where I get my information from. As well, just um, you know, send me a DM on this, and I'll I'll send it over to you. Um, you had open, um, but, yeah. Oh, sorry, Andrew, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, go ahead. Uh, you had open the ACDNR. I don't know what that is. If you so wouldn't that mind, that is yeah. So there's a specific um star reduction technique I like to use it with, um, but in general, it just creates another mask. So let me, let me okay. share my screen. Sorry, let me figure out how to reshare my screen. Um, okay, can everyone see Pix Insight? Yes. Yeah. Um, so unlike range selection, which just um, is very straightforward picking color ranges, I believe ACDNR is better for distinguishing between the shadows, midtones, and highlights. So it's it's a lot more selective with different parts of the um, curve. Um, it also has a lot of other functions that I'm not as familiar with. I use it for masking. So um, unlike range selection, which produces its own mask, this will apply to the image. So what you have to do is create a clone. So I have a clone. Um, and then you go to this lightness mask portion and then you select preview and open up a preview. So it basically inverts the image and then what you can um, tweak are the midtone shadows and highlights and through that select different things. And just keep in mind what it's, what you're, it's going to create is uh, black and white. So it's going to 
uh, distinguish between the black, which is you know what you'll select or deselect, and the white, which is the opposite. Um, so say for this, I want to create a mask of, um, well, see now the stars are combined. So whatever I create a mask of that's going to affect the galaxy is also going to affect the stars, which is why I like starless processing. But just a quick example, you know, I want to create a heavy mask for the galaxy. I'll bring this, this midtone slider down and then I'll bring this shadow slider up to really, um, you know, distinguish between the brights and the darks. Um, I'll close that preview and apply this to my clone. And now we have a mask. Huh. So I, I find this works really well for nebula, where you have parts of the nebula that are brighter than others. And what you could do is you could create a mask that isn't just nebula versus background, but has different degrees of masking throughout the different um, lightness parts of the nebula. So then what you could do is when you recombine stars, you can suppress star addition in the brighter parts of the nebula um, and then make them appear more in the darker parts to kind of make the nebula pop a little bit more, mm. if that makes sense. But you're saying it like um, basically like feathers the mask. Based it feathers on how... respective to yeah. mm -hmm, the different like tones in the um in the image. I don't know if I'm using the right terminology, but um I like I feel it. like yeah. range selection, like if like yeah, if you look at just remove this mask a sec. You could think of it as the density of the mask also, I think. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, like if you look at if you look at this mask, like you see how it kind of fades uh -huh. out here, um, and it's denser in the in the middle where it's brighter, and it kind of like feathers out, um, as opposed to uh, range selection, where right. you don't get that; you just get this blob of white. So now oh, that's so interesting. You have the AC, yep. So now you have the AC AC DNR, which again you have to apply to a, a clone stamp. So you can make this into a mask. And then to feather it further, what I like doing is, oh, I'm sorry, I'm clicking a lot of random things. I like to convolute it. You blur it. Because you don't want any of your masks to be have sharp edges because then you're going to get um, a lot of contrast between what's masked and what's not masked. So I like to blur everything. And then you just apply convolution the mask and then you get a nice blurred um acdnr mask which this is all again are kind of artistic at this point so it just um you know can be used for different applications but i specifically use this for uh star addition so what i do when i add stars to um a nebula image in particular is i will do two stretches on the stars i'll do a very light stretch and then um, do an AC DNR mask and only, and I'll mask out the nebula and the galaxy and only apply the light stretch to the background. And then what I'll do is I will take the mask off. So I'll have an unmasked image. I'll stretch my stars further for the bright stars. And then what I'll do is a range selection on the star's image. And then what it's only gonna get are the brighter stars. Move it, run it. And then what I'll do is I'll take this range selection mask. I mean, this is already stars added, so pretend there's no stars add it to here and then add the stars back. So it's only gonna add in the brighter stars. So what you've essentially done is applied a lightly stretched star image to the background. So you can get some background stars, but suppressed stars in the nebula. And then when you add the more stretched stars, you're only adding the brightest stars to the nebula so that all those other smaller um, kind of background stars that aren't essential to the nebula are getting suppressed and what it does is it makes the nebula pop a lot more does that make sense yeah so you what you're doing is you're making you're, you're creating a situation where the stars that are in the background not in the nebula are stretched more than the stars that are in the nebula but then you've selected the brighter stars within the nebula 
because um, I, I don't know if I followed that last part actually. Kind of. It's it's really it's hard to explain with that. Let me see if I have anything I could show as an example. It sounds a little like the luminosity masks in Photoshop. It reminds me of creating um, luminosity yeah. masks in Photoshop. Yeah. Like I have the DKA definitely... plugin that that you need it for that. There's others. And I've mm -hmm. done similar stuff for creating detailed masks. But I never yeah. saw like what you're doing where you're applying it to the stretch. So it looks like some portions of your image are stretched more than other portions. That's correct. And I, okay. I'll show you a quick example now of, um, let me just make sure I'm opening the right thing. Okay, I'm gonna use this actually of the flaming star which i just finished okay let me just close out some of this other stuff so it doesn't get too cluttered okay so hmm, okay just have to orient myself sorry this i actually just finished this image this is um the flaming star nebula from the ap175 and this was a or is an ha rgb combination um so okay sorry i just have to look and see where i am in the process so okay i have a stretch ha rgb image and unstretched stars so basically at the point where i'm done with this um this part and now i want to add the stars back in so i'm going to unstretch this um and then um basically open up ghf i'm going to reset this um and i'm going to do a very light stretch just until i start seeing some background stars because you know you want to so see how it go all the way up and get all those little background stars? They're very distracting to the image. And again, this isn't this is a more artistic element to it. Um, but I just stretch it to the point where I'm getting some background stars, but not too many, because I don't want them to be too distracting. So very light stretch. I'm going to apply that. Um, reset this. Get out of the preview. Okay, so now I have a lightly stretched star image. So now all I want, I don't want to put stars, too many stars in the nebula because it's going to distract from the nebula, but I want to fill in the background with some stars. So I'm going to do the ACDNR. Okay, oops. Right. I'm going to create a clone that's going to end up being the mask. Open up preview. And then I'm going to tweak it till it. Uh, so I get some distinguishing between the background and um, the nebula. And you don't want it to be too dramatic or else you're going to really, it's going to look unrealistic where you have too much distinguishing between the background and the nebula uh, suppression, but just a little bit. Um, okay. So let me do a little bit. Okay, let me turn that. I have the mask, I'm just gonna blur it. Evolution. Okay, I'm going to apply this. So now I'm protecting the nebula. Um, um, so I'm gonna need to just rename these um, so my Pixel math will work. So stars, starless. I'm just going to, I'm not going to remove the mask, but I'm just going to not show the mask. So it's still there. And you could tell if anyone's not familiar, the mask is applied because this image identifier is orange. Um, open up my pixel math, which already has my formula there, and apply. So now um, it's not um very dramatic but essentially there's more stars in the background than there are in the nebula itself but there's a lot missing where there should be especially 
um, I forgot the star designation, but this bright one right here, that's kind of the main feature of this reflection portion. Um, I forgot it's like Mu Auriga, or I don't know if anyone knows, please enlighten me. Um, so now I want to go back to the stars image. Um, I'm going to delete that. Actually, no, I don't want to delete the mask. I'm going to remove the mask. Remove mask. Um, there's my stars image. Get that back. I'm going to stretch it a little bit further. Tap the highlights and tighten them up a little bit as I'm stretching. So can you, can you guys see the difference between this and this? Yep. As I tighten them up. Okay. A little bit more. And I'm I'm going kind of fast now, but generally I would apply it, see, make sure I don't blow anything out, and you know do it iteratively. Okay, so that's definitely much brighter. Um, now, so what I want to do is I want to apply only the brighter stars to the image and include them in the nebula, um, and then I don't want to bring out more background stars. So to do that, I'm going to use a range mask on the star image uh, range selection. So I'm going to open this up. I'm going to reset it. So I'm going to go to the point where I'm going to apply some smoothness where it kind of looks like this, where you get the brighter stars and then a little bit of the background, um, kind of the medium brightness stars, and then all the more fainter stars are masked out. Run that. To apply this mask to the image. So now, as I reapply the further stretched stars, re screen them in, um, it's only going to take the brightest stars. I'll show the mask. So everything's protected except the areas of the stars I want to add back in. So I'm going to just reopen my formula. Add them in. And that's it. Um, I can show you the difference between this and just adding the stars fully stretched um, just for some comparison. Move that mask and um, uh, create a clone. Oh, I can't do that. Hold on. So. How should I do this? Um, I'm just going to have to re-remove these stars. Actually, ah, crap. Hold on. And create a clone so we can compare and then re-remove the stars. And I'm not generating a star image. Okay, so this is our comparison. And now I have those fully stretched stars. I'm going to add them in with no mask to this. And this is the comparison. Can everyone see the difference in yeah, kind of the background stars and the yeah. stars in the nebula. So it's really, for me, it's, you know, making the background stars not as distracting, but also bringing out the nebula more by highlighting the brighter stars within it and suppressing those smaller distracting stars. Um, and again, it's, you are messing with the data. Um, I, there are a lot of stars that we have information for that are not in the final image. Um, so it is kind of like, an artistic um, component, but, you know, I think, um, you know, I like that. So <laughs> that's just me. 
Yeah, I say go go Um, for it. That's very nice. Yeah. Yeah, it it, it looks great. This is uh, Thanks. I think this one was really nice. Yeah, the nebula, all the wispiness. Yeah. It's much more obvious. It's beautiful. So and when you and when you did this, I know you mentioned you you used uh you, you did something to make sure that the the broadband light in the reflection area was prominent. Because it, it, yeah, when you yeah, so... when you use HA HA layers, it it kills all of the yeah yeah so the, the easiest thing would have been to to just do the one shot color rgb image and it would have looked i would have had to get more data to be able to pull out this wispiness um but right. it still would have looked good but i wanted to i mean this is a very ha um heavy nebula and i wanted to bring it out a lot of that and the ha has a lot of detail in it so what i did was I did an HA RGB combination, which combines the HA with the RGB. So you won't lose any of the reflection, but then I wanted to kind of implore that technique with the color image and then some type of luminance image. So I used the HA as a luminance layer. Um, so I did that same thing where I took the HA mm-hmm. RGB, I, I blurred it a little bit and then added the just HA as luminance. But then what I realized is that it was adding yeah. luminance to everything except the reflection. So what I had to do was create two images, um, an HA as a luminance that on the HA RGB, and then just an HA RGB where I increased the, um, the sharpening in this mm-hmm. area a little bit, and then I combine them uh, with pixel math and with masking. So it was a uh, kind of a trial and error multi-step process um, yeah. because you know I think when you when you do that it can also be easy to mess with the data and eliminate parts that you don't want. But ultimately, I was able to bring out the HA, the RGB, a good part of this reflection component besides the dusty part, this like kind of wispy bluish reflection part. Um, so you know, I was ultimately happy with the with the final result. But I think, you know, the way I the way I look at it is I I try and imagine what I want the final result to be, and then take what I have, and then figure mm-hmm. out how do I get from, you know, the raw data the raw data to the final image, um, you know, as close as possible with the information that you have. Yeah, um, you get, and then you know, sorry. No, I was just gonna say with the with the data the telescope gets you get. You get to see all these features, especially in the in the RGB channels that mm-hmm. are just really pretty tremendous. Yeah. So um oh you definitely um get a little spoiled by it. Mm-hmm. But I think, you know, one thing, the more I process, the more I figure, you know, all these things like, you know, how to take some narrow band component and combine it with a reflection nebula and it's you know you start to realize that you know when you look at nebula you really need to think of what comprises it you know a lot of mm-hmm. times there's multiple different types of nebula and how do i bring out each thing to get the final image i want and then when you go back and take images you think about that from the beginning and it's like okay do i need to waste time with an ha um with HA information or can I just do LRGB or do I want some O3 in there? It's like, right. you know, you start to think about these things and it affects the way you image as well. Um, and I'm still, you know, learning all this stuff. And, you know, every time, I think every time I image and process and I go back to imaging, it's like, you know, I, I think about it a little bit differently. So it's, uh, you know, it's just one of the things I, I love about this is that it's like a constant learning process and you're constantly growing. And at the same time, PixInsight is is coming out with new versions and new processes and, uh, you know, it's just always changing. So it can get overwhelming with keeping up with things, not getting fixed in, in kind of old ways. Um, but that also, I think, adds to the, the allure of it. This is great, um, Andrew. Yeah. I think I like the, I like your technique having a, having a light touch on a lot of things. I think you're you're able to maintain 
sort of almost like a three-dimensional look around things like a nebula where there, there are definite clouds and dark areas and uh, people that are heavier handed, it, it, it looks very flat, I think, when mm -hmm. uh, if, looks, you, if you overdo it. Yeah, like yeah. a lot of images that you see, it looks like they're just placing the stars on top of the nebula. It's like sitting on top. You already, what you did makes it look three-dimensional, like it's layered, which is really nice. Yeah, and that's the exact effect that I want. And again, it's, you know, that you're bringing in a more of an artistic component to it. But, you know, I I think that, you know, for a lot of us, the images we post or, you know, put on Astrobin, Instagram, um, whatever, you know, we're, we're doing it with, you know, some type of scientific mindset, you know, in terms of it being astrophotography and astronomy. But, you know, there is definitely a big artistic component to it as well. You know, we're not, you know, scientifically analyzing this data. So, you know, I ethically think it's okay for myself at least. Um, but, you know, you, you always have to consider when you're doing things like this, you know, that you are manipulating the data um, and the final image isn't truly representative of the information you've captured. Um, so, you know, using it tastefully, I think is important. Um, but one, I, I would say the biggest things I've, I've, um, kind of improved on is creating a nice background. So using that GHS to not, you know, distinct, um, create too much contrast between a really dark background and a really bright, um, object, which, you know, you try and make it what space is, you know, in the background of space essentially is not black. Um, so just focusing on that and focusing on not blowing out the highlights when you're trying to bring out the wispy details, but not bring up bright details as much. Um, so, you know, I think GHS is definitely a, a very, very valuable tool to learn that has, you know, a decent learning curve, but it's made a huge difference in, in processing and also doing star starless processing of the nebula and galaxies and then adding the stars back in later. Thank you. Um, no yeah. more. Yeah, no more questions. Um, I think that's all the techniques I have. Um, yeah. Any uh, last minute questions? Well, I'm I'm curious because first of all, I use one shot color, right? I'm using a smart scope, but now I'm starting to use the AT60. And one of the things that I've been doing, and it's from watching many other people on YouTube is I usually do the screen transfer function before I do the background extraction, but you did it the other way around. Is there a reason for that? Uh, I'm not saying that mine is the right way. I'm just curious. Well, the before I did the back, um, you mean like the dynamic background extract, the DBE? Yeah. Um, the, the, that was just an auto STF, um, which isn't a true stretching, but it's more of a preview of what it would look like stretched. So it's not doing anything to the the data. It's just showing you a preview of what it would look like if it was in stretch form. Okay. So you can visualize um, the background versus the stars versus the nebulae. Um, so that's all that is. And then GHS is when you actually take it from linear to nonlinear. It's taking a peek. Got it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And I've seen some people do their, their star extraction in the linear stage before the nonlinear, what are your thoughts on that? Um, I did that um, because when I stretch the image, um, I don't want to stretch it with the stars. Does that make sense? I think that's actually the biggest benefit of, of starless processing because um, stars are, are probably the brightest part of your image. So if you're trying to bring out um, very faint details. Um, you have to stretch the image a decent amount. So if the stars are in it, you're going to blow those out way before you are able to bring out those fainter details. Mm -hmm. um, so I generally pull um, the stars right before stretching in both the RGB and lumens. How about you, David? Actually, yeah, it's, it's, it's I use the same process, and especially too with Nebula, you know, you're uh, you're shooting in the Milky Way. 
which is like tons of stars. Um, galaxies is a little bit often you get images with less stars, but yeah, like the image I worked on with the crescent recently, and then like the one I helped you with, a lot of stars in that image. But if you and if you mm -hmm. stretch it at the same rate that you do the nebula, the uh, it looks very crowded. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I actually, um, I, you know, I do some um, wide field, like nightscape type images too with the Milky Way, um, or like deep scapes, um, you know, with a foreground, a landscape foreground, and you know, some other object. I started taking those um, wide field, like Milky Way images, and processing them in Pix and Sight, very similar to what I'm doing with these. Uh, uh, deep space object images um and you know i think the results are great again you have to do you have to do it tastefully where your final result is realistic um but, you know pics and situs in your phase of processing is uh, there's nothing else comparable in my head i mean i'm sorry that's a very biased statement because i don't have experience with a lot of the other programs but you know i think for linear processing it's very powerful Nonlinear, um, I, you know, do some stuff in here and I do a lot more in uh, Photoshop just because I'm also pretty comfortable with that. Yeah, Andrew, I, I uh, like when I create a luminance layer and I've got star layer, then I think I'm, I'm in layer based editing. So I'm, I'm in Photoshop basically mm -hmm. at that point. Um, I've yeah, never Photoshop even tried is... to to do what to do what uh, as you you know you showed off at the end uh yeah the um i think the the biggest benefit to so i i try and use pics inside as much as possible only because you're working with 32 um 32 bit depth xisf files mm -hmm. so there's still a little bit more information in there before you convert it to a tiff sure um but in general, I'll, you know, definitely do a lot of, a lot more curves adjustment, um, you know, selective color saturation and color um, luminance um, work in Photoshop before I combine it with the star image. Um, you know, work iteratively and, mm -hmm. you know, in layers with more, much more intricate masking, like Pixel Sight sucks for masks. Yeah. Um, you know, there, there are a few other things that I didn't show, like game masks. And um, there's, um, I think, a script you can download that lets you combine different, like a range mask with a game mask. And it basically tries to mimic what Photoshop can do um, yeah. natively. Um, but yeah, I definitely, um, you know, end up doing a big combination of both. But again, I try and do as much as possible in Pix and Sight just to preserve as much information. Did you say you used? Fix insight for Milky Way images. Yeah. Why feel? Yeah, I do. Um, so That's interesting. mostly, yeah. So um, let's see, what do I mostly use it for with the Milky Way? Um, but that I would be with some. But that wouldn't be with an astro camera. That would be with a a regular, for lack of a better word, camera, either mirrorless yeah, or DSLR. But... Yeah, but um, you know, one shot color sensor like um, you know, on the AT sixty. Um, yeah, I was confused. Eighteen AP AT sixty that has the um, ASI twenty six hundred MC attached to it, which is um, an ASPC color sensor. That's um, true. Which, yeah. Uh, yeah. So um, you know, from that regard, it's the same, except you don't have cooling. Um, but you know, I. I use um, a Sony A7 III that's um, H alpha modified. Uh, um, so, you know, I, I still stack the photos. I use dark frames. I don't typically use light frames, but you can. And then um, you're working with a file that you could treat essentially the same as one taken true. from the 2600. Yeah. Um, and I use it for, I, I take the stars out. I apply cur I sh um when you do it the way i'm just um with the milky way i stack it in a different program i use a starry landscape stacker yeah and then I when I import that, that file, it, 
Yeah, it's already it's already kind of stretched, so I don't have to stretch it. So all the things you saw before stretching, I don't generally do. But what I'll do is I'll take the stars out and then I'll, I'll um, work on the Milky Way with starless, um, you know, add some contrast via curves. I'll do some gradient work. Um, I'll take some of the gradients out, um, especially if there's light pollution. Um, and that's pretty much it. I really don't do too much in Pix and Sight, but I think just taking the stars out and doing some work on the starless version makes a really, really big difference. Interesting. And then that's screening them fun. back in. Yeah. Huh. And Andrew, I think you, my, my, the question I was going to ask was, can you take the stars out of a, a wide, a wide angle shot of the Milky Way? And it sounds like you can. Uh, oh, absolutely. It works really also, well with Star Exterminator. But also, can you do the same process where you demonstrated with the nebula here, where you're essentially toning down the stars and then uh, it's so mm -hmm. more of the brighter ones show through uh, and so that yeah. you essentially get less stars in the uh, less stars and then combine that with the with back, combine it back with the Milky Way. Yeah, I um I I definitely do that. And I think it works a little bit better than um when you use um I mean you could do it in Photoshop too, but I think that you know you want the, the bigger, brighter stars and you want to suppress the background because I think those brighter stars and the wide field Milky Way shots add some depth into it. Um and when you apply things like range masks and you can selectively uh, pick those brighter stars and then add them back in and then and then suppress the smaller ones it's just so it, it works a little bit better and picks in sight for that yeah i think that, um, uh, well the one thing that uh, this this friend who's a retired astronomer in flagstaff and i we've been talking for a few years about how to essentially create a very realistic image of what the milky way looks like in a dark sky site because if you're just processing it in uh, in Photoshop or uh, image processing software, uh, it, it, it's like keeping the stars in a nebula. If you if you uh, do a stretch, do a curve, then you're affecting everything, and it's and then uh, yeah. just just darkening the sky doesn't suppress the stars in a, in a similar in the same in the same way. So because the yeah, your, your your eye reacts to the dense part of the Milky Way different than than to the stars and the sky, and so you 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 see it much differently than what a camera records. Uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, you saw again with um, you know, like the flaming star, for example. Yeah. There's no if you were to um, stretch this with stars in, there's no way you'd be able to pull out this wispiness without blowing out the stars. Right. So same thing with milky way photos um you know you can't bring out that milky way core i mean without you could apply like radial gradients and things but it, it's just very harsh you know you could do it a lot a lot more natural looking i think if you can extract the stars stretch the core and then reapply the stars afterwards right so yeah. I'm, I'm a big fan of of um starless processing i was just going to mention that uh the Star Exterminator, it's also a Photoshop plugin when you buy it. And then um, StarNet++, which is the free version, which works just as well, is it works standalone. So, mm -hmm. But now when you, I've never used um, Star Exterminator with um, Photoshop, but when you use in Photoshop, can you screen the star, unscreen and screen the stars back in, or is it just adding? You because are I think... Um, hmm? Oh, it's a little bit, it's a little bit weird. Like you have to, basically you have to create, I haven't done it in a while, but you have to create, you have to duplicate your image and then it removes the stars, but then you have to, um, like subtract your duplicated image from the starless image to get your, only your stars, and then you can screen them back in. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know how that compares to, to doing it in Pix. I, I think yeah. that I would take those images and put them into Pix and site because that aspect of it, the star removal and, and you know, just working on the nebula component, I'm more familiar with in, in Pix and site. So I've kind of kept that aspect um, separate. Um, but I mean, if you could do everything in one program, that's always, always great, I think.
Yeah, I'm just thinking too, if you're if you're working on something like a Milky Way image, you're probably mostly in Photoshop, but I don't know. Um, yeah. Yeah, for the most part, I mean, I think the the pix and side component of it's probably like, you know, it takes like 20 minutes, you know, just take the stars out, work on the, the Milky Way a little bit, add them back in, then go back to Photoshop. So it's really with the wide, wide field stuff, not much that I do, not pix and sight. But I think what I, you know, that concept is, you know, the starless working on it starless is makes the biggest difference I've seen in terms of your final image. Oh, and also I, I'm pretty sure noise exterminator works in Photoshop as well, but you know, I do some noise exterminator. I've even done blur exterminator on, um, a Milky way image and it affects, um, some aberrations. It affects, um, you know, if you have any comma, or you know your corner your, your stars aren't yeah. perfect it'll correct those as well so very powerful stuff it's really miraculous like i i shoot with a reflector and i have a coma corrector mm -hmm. but you still get tons of coma with and yeah. uh it just cures it it's gone like i, I don't even think uh yeah. might even not not even need the corrector so yeah yeah it's it's pretty wild um but yeah who knows in, you know another few years what tools we're gonna yeah. have i'm sure this whole flow i went through will be completely different you know even in a year from now so i have a question yeah. since since you brought up the at60 before there's a quad mm -hmm. filter on the at60 besides a idas what's the quad mm -hmm. what is the quad um, it allows some wavelengths of lights from four different um, um, emission lines. So it has um, hydrogen alpha, hydrogen beta, um, O3, and S2. Okay. So a lot, a lot of emission nebulae, you know, have um, multiple emission lines um, coming from it. So you know, sulfur, oxygen, hydrogen. Um, biggest, I think three biggest elements that are, you know, components of what we consider emission nebula. So the quad band filter will allow in the wavelengths of light from those three plus hydrogen beta, um, which in a lot of narrow band imaging we do, um, we don't um, account for. So it does that and then projects it onto the one shot color um sensor um that being said you need so and then what it does is every other wavelength so if you have um you know a, a dark nebula or reflection nebula it might not come through as well um but you'll get all four of those wavelengths onto the um one shot color sensor um mm -hmm. and then you get a really nice emission nebula image from that um, then you can further break that apart and pick some sight and, you know, somewhat separate the components and then do work on it almost as if you have a monochrome camera and narrowband filters, um, dedicated narrowband filters. But, you know, that's that's like its whole own technique. Um, another benefit to it that we don't use for the AT60 is that you can actually use that as a luminance filter for an emission nebula on a monochrome sensor, um, which typically when we take um, an image of an emission nebula with a monochrome sensor, we do HSO um, to get those emission lines. And then there's no real luminance that we take, but you can use this and get all three of those plus the hydrogen beta um, as one image and it's 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 a nice luminance um but huh. yeah thank you. that's just another possibility with it yeah thank you mm -hmm. so yeah i think that's it um you know thank you guys for joining and you know i think there's a lot of possibilities for future processing sessions. I don't even want to call them tutorials because it's kind of, uh, you know, one person running through their, their process, but it's collaborative. So, 
you know, sessions. I think future sessions will be nice. Um, we could, you know, do different types of images as well. Narrow band, one shot color, you know, so on and so forth. Yeah, can't wait for your can't wait for your next one, Andy. Yeah. yeah. Thanks yeah. for set thanks yeah, for setting this up. Else. It was really nice yeah, and I learned beautiful. a lot. So yeah. It looks, uh, it looks yeah, like Dave knows a lot uh, too. So may maybe he can give us something. <laughs> yeah. Not to put you yeah. Yeah. Well. No, no, I I, be, I know I'd be happy to, but I don't want to uh I mean uh you Andrew Andrew, Andrew did did a great job with this and you know I wanna uh he, he can continue. I, I learned a lot, so no, yeah. but, well, uh, <laughs> so just uh, try and uh, maybe Andrew will learn a lot from you too. Yeah, that's I, true. I definitely yeah. learned from from both of you. I'm sure uh, that would be very difficult. Yeah, well, well I'd be I happy. I'd be happy to talk know. to talk through my process a little bit. It's very similar, though, honestly, to to what Andrew's doing. Well, I think well, a I different think... kind of picture. So yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it'd be good to have. I think whole, the pet, you know, be good to have a whole series of this where people do different sessions and talk about their own. Yeah, their despite own despite people's levels of comfort, you know, I think that everyone has something they could share that other people can learn from. So, and as you see, like you know, I went through my process, but even within each process you're running on PixInsight, there's many different things you could do. So it's just so intricate and there's so many different ways of doing things. There's no standard for anything. Um, so, you know, I think hearing from other people as well would definitely be beneficial. All right. But, uh, you know, thanks everyone for tuning in. And thank you. hope everyone thank has you, a good night. Andrew. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thanks.